um, a great way to do it because it looks like you did, but it's a small one, so it doesn't really need uh, all of the intensity. I am going to share this live stream really fast for those people on Facebook so they can see it. Uh, all right. And if you are tuning in, let us know um, a couple of things. I'd love to know if you're winding down your weekend with us, what kind of uh, drinks or snacks you've got while you're watching. And then uh, let's, you know, if you've got some really exciting plans coming up. Um, or what your favorite comic of the week was. I'd love to hear that. Um, oh, Nick, thank you. Nick says we are streaming uh, live from Mysterium Escape Rooms, downtown Sarasota, across from the Hollywood Theater. Um, if you haven't been, they have all kinds of cool escape rooms. You have to go check them out. Um, and what's really cool is we've got all the information for you right here at that city that's upside down um, about all the different rooms. I think I get this flyer picked up uh, all day every day so Nick just know that you're probably gonna have to be bringing me some more of these soon um, and know that if you bring your receipt from Mysterium saying you went and did an escape room bring your receipt from there into Bat City will give you 10% off um, and if you take a Bat City receipt over to Mysterium Monday through Thursday they'll give you 20% off of your escape room experience so uh, mm -hmm. shout out to Mysterium this is a great thing to do for your, like, if you have friends and family in town for the holidays and you're in the Sarasota Bradenton area, this is a great way to entertain people for an evening. Um, ooh, Ram says he's drinking hot chocolate with a Christmas donut. How festive. That's so festive. I love that. Thanks for tuning in, guys. Um, we are going to dive right into our comics that we have coming out, that came out this week, um, because there are some of them that are on my favorites list already and some that are definitely going to be added to my favorites list after this week so I want to make sure we have plenty of time to talk about all of them I'm going to slide that over I'm so nervous I just got I finally committed to upgrading to you know a phone from like the last three years and I'm now nervous that it's going to break at all times so um we've got out this week we have issue five of love everlasting from Tom King um, this is, it's on image. We haven't, we've been talking a lot about Tom King as what he's been doing at DC Comics a lot recently and all of the books that he's done. You know, we always talk about Mr. Miracle and the visions when it comes to Tom King, but I feel like it's been a minute since we've really talked about a big indie book from Tom King and especially one that's gone in a completely different direction. Um, and this is definitely the one, uh, this is a woman named Joan who lives inside of romance novel, essentially. She is she has the perfect life. She finds the perfect man. They get engaged. And then every time she either decides to or does not decide to marry the man of her dreams, somebody shows up that's dressed like a cowboy and kills her. And when she wakes up, she's in some other romance novel, living out some other romantic perfection and falling in love with somebody only to have it happen over and over again. Um, this has been a fantastic book with this amazing Darwin Cook style art. But what's really, really cool about this, this particular issue is she didn't wake up inside of another romance novel. She woke up at a therapist office and this woman is the therapist for people who have problems in their romance. And she knows all about Joan's situation. She knows that Joan's been hopping from one story to the other. And we find out a little bit about who's behind that in this particular issue. Um, we start to learn how Joan is being forced into this situation. But we don't really get the why. Um, but it's it's really, really cool. I love seeing this woman who's like, all right, we're just, we got to figure out what your issue is because that's why you keep jumping through all these things. Like you got to stop blaming other people for your problem. And Joan is like, I literally wake up in a romance novel, live it out and then get killed no matter what I do. Like, how is this me not taking responsibility for my own problems? Like, I don't feel like I made that problem. Um, and then she kind of handles this situation herself this time. And she's um, I love it because the longer we go on, the more agency Joan is giving herself within her relationships, which is a great, um, it's honestly a great look at what Tom King says in a lot of his books is that you do take responsibility for your own actions and you can own the choices you make. And this is doing it in such a cool way. And um, I'm not even the biggest like romance novel person, but I feel like I've read 30 of them this year just from reading the last four issues of this book. And I cannot wait now that we're on a hint about where this is going. I cannot wait to see 
where it actually uh, ends up. And again, I always say that until we hit like issue eight with Tom King, we don't really know what the book's about. I think we started to see a twist here at five and start to get the information. But I think Love Everlasting still has so much more to give us that Tom King is just starting to tease into the puzzle. Um, if you have not picked this up, you are missing out. And like, if you have a fr friend who's like, oh, I love romance novels, I don't like comics, give them this. And if you have a fan who friend who loves comics, in general, give them this because the storytelling and the artwork is amazing. And if you have friends who are like, I'm a star when cook, honestly, just throw this book at them. Just like in their faces. Um, I'm going to move this so that I have room to put my books down. Um, all right. We are going to switch over to something completely and totally darker than that. Um, with 10,000 Black Feathers. Uh, this is a part of the Bone Orchard Mythos world that Jeff Lemire and Andrea Sorrentino are building together. And this is issue four of this particular one. Um, all of these series are going to be different formats. So the first part of the Bone Orchard Mythos was The Passageway, which was a hardcover graphic novel. Um, and then this is a six-part mini. And the cool thing is that you do get all those like crazy Sorrentino panels. Um, but this is a, a story about a young girl and her best friend. And at some point in the in the past, when they were teenagers, uh, her best friend went missing. And she has always assumed that it was somebody murdered her. She pinned it on a guy who was at a club with them, and they found out that like he had they can't prove anything about him doing it. So she ended up moving off to college and trying to start over again without her best friend. And the only person back home who kind of waits on her is the uh, mom of the the best friend. And this in this series, she's actually come home. And all of those demons are kind of resurfacing. And quite literally, in some cases, there's something to do with this man um, and these feathers and this imaginary world that they created that may have spilled over into their own world and possibly destroyed them. Um, I'm really curious to see who's gonna, if we find out who the murderer is and what we find out, and I'm curious to see how all of these stories connect within the Bone Orchard uh, mythos, because there is gonna be something uh, that connects them all, but this has just been such a weird, interesting story, and it's very much Jeff Lemire and Sorrentino. They did Gideon Falls together. Um, this is it's just them kind of playing in that same way that they did, where those that loose horror, but that leaves you with that eerie feeling more than anything as you're just kind of piecing together pe like puzzle pieces of a mystery. Um, this kind of has that same feeling, and we get the back and forth of the when the girl lived there originally and then where she's at now and then all of this weird stuff going on. So if you like Jeff Lemire, you're going to love it. Um, and you should check it out because it's only on issue four. Um, we've got coming back to us. I always, anytime there's a slight five minute delay between issues, I always get sad. Um, but Ice Cream Man issue 33 is out this week um, uh, from Image Comics. This is um, a horror anthology. And that for the longest time I wouldn't talk on the, about on the live stream because I figured everybody was reading it and it was always selling out. Um, but I just don't want you to ever have that disservice of not hearing about what Ice Cream Man is. So um, overall story is that there is an Ice Cream Man who seems to have some kind of demonic supernatural powers wherever he goes, things happen um, that give people an existential crisis. And the cool thing is, is that the, the creative team always plays with the medium. And in this issue... The play that they do is you have something that is um, in, you have colorful page panels and then you always have black and white panels. And the story is W. Maxwell Prince is telling you, I wish I could tell you a story that was about a guy who has a great day and he goes out and he meets the love of his life and he like does it all at a coffee shop and while he's out he has this great experience and then something bad happens and he's able to rally the entire town to help out and save the day um, and he's like but but that's not the story that I'm telling the story that I'm telling is about a guy who who never can get his life together and who's always going to be depressed and sad and who goes home and lays awake at night and he just every panel matches like the top and the bottom match exactly in every page so that you can get that story exactly of what he is experiencing and it's kind of the way a lot of people think about their lives you know they say oh I wish my life was better I wish it was this wonderful thing and they imagine what the scenario would be if they had this perfect life. And in reality, like 
if you look at what ha- is happening in the book, he's just not making the choice ever to have a good life. He's never making the choice to help another person or to talk to the person next to him or to set his alarm for the five minutes earlier that would get him there on time. And it's kind of W. Maxwell Prince's, we put ourselves in this cyclical nature of, well, nothing good ever happens to me, but then you just ignore the good thing and you accept the mediocre and you don't move on, Um, which is kind of really just the theme of Ice Cream Man all the time is, you know, we... We all do this to ourselves, and we're always in these existential crises that we build out for ourselves. Um, If you haven't read it, it doesn't matter which issue you pick up. It's an anthology. You can start at any issue, any time of Ice Cream Man, and no matter what, you're going to love it because it's if you have any interest in horror and off-the-beaten-path stories at all, Ice Cream Man is going to be the book for you. And um, W. Maxwell Prince will probably never end it because it's just you can. there's always a story to tell there. Um, also from Image on the Skybound imprint, we have issue three of Dark Ride out this week. This is Joshua Williamson's, Williamson's story, um, that he kind of came up with because he always likes to write a horror book and he wanted to write a horror book, but he also has this obsession with amusement parks and Disney World. And so he thought, what if Walt had created, like been a really crazy person and had created his whole entire park to be based in horror and so this is the story of an amusement park that's basically disney world but it's all built around horror and it's got a crazy eccentric old man who's in charge and his two kids who are literally named uh Samhain and halloween and they're uh, twins a boy and a girl and they're adults now and they're kind of supposed to be the ones taking over uh Samhain, who they call sam um, is the one who runs the daily operations and she's kind of the, like the sister is this over the top performer who wants, who wants to be included and is kind of the golden child because she does all the crazy stuff. Anyway, these people have this theme park and in our first issue, we had a kid who was so excited to go work there. And at the end of the issue, he goes missing. And now our B story in this book is that Um, his sister is working to find him. So she has gotten a job at the park and she is investigating everything that she can. So we kind of are following along as she is trying to piece piece together what happened to her brother and what's really going on at this park. Um, And stories are intersecting. At at this point, issue three, we're starting to see some of the stories kind of intersect and I really want to see where they go um, and how that's going to play out a little bit more and more. And also, um, there might be some demons at this park that even the people in charge don't know about. And so uh, things are going to get a lot darker when we fall into issue four. And I cannot wait for next month when that comes out. Um, from Red 5 Comics, we have issue three of four of Mystery Brothers. Uh, this is this book has been coming out really, really fast, so it makes me think it might have had some some delays that held up issue one and two because I feel like one, two, and three kind of all fell uh, back to back to back. But this is a story of a young boy whose parents are separated. I'm not sure if they're necessarily divorced, but they're separated, and he's never really lived with his dad, uh, who is a great inventor, and he works for a company that's run by a, a name literally a man literally named Mister Profit. And Mr. Prophet is a very greedy man who just wants to use everybody for his, like, for his personal gain. And uh, this young boy goes to stay with his dad and finds out that his dad has made him another brother. And we don't know how. We know he's not an android. We know he's, like, possibly a clone. We don't really know. We're kind of piecing it together. But the dad's big experiment that he was supposed to be working on was actually making android house servants. And um, android goes crazy. Something bad happens to dad. And now these two would-be brothers are on a mission together to figure out what's going to happen to each other, who the one boy is, how to stop Mr. Profit and the Profit Corporation, um, and how to save his mom, who seems to gotten wrapped up in all of it just by trying to help. So um, just a fun a little adventure that's only going to be four parts. It's a super easy read, but it kind of just draws you in and you're constantly like, I'm still wanting to know what, what we're going to find out about the brothers and how they're connected. But I love that they're like, oh, well, you're my brother now, so we got we to gotta work together, and I love that for them. Uh, Mystery Brothers, if you haven't read it, check it out. Um, From Sumerian Comics, we have issue two of Nobody's Girls, um, which I believe is only a three-part series. 
Um, and I have no idea how you could possibly wrap this up if it is in one more issue. So I, I'm hoping there's at least two more issues, but I think it's three parts. Um, this is the story of a man who is a teacher and kind of feels completely dissatisfied with his life, doesn't think he's going anywhere, feels like he's failing everybody, um, and has kind of a voyeurism aspect to him. So he goes home at night and rents, uh, you know, stops at the video store and rents adult films. And while watching an adult film one night, he suddenly it glitches and he sees a video message from a woman who's bound and chained and is like, help me, please help me, they're going to kill me. And he goes to the store and is trying to get them to um, look into it for him. And when nobody will, he ends up teaming up with a young girl who drops a yearbook on his doorstep and circles the girl from the thing the video and is like this is who you're looking for and issue one kind of saw them build up their team like of the two of them and kind of start on their adventure together and this is them just going through more and more of the puzzle and uh, trying to figure out who it is and learning different things about themselves and all of the people that they interact with uh whole book is in black and white there's a lot of just that slow moving drama movie kind of situation where nothing is said, but the way somebody moves their hand in the shot, you're like, oh man, that just said a lot about that character. Like I see what you're doing here. Um, or the way somebody like puts something away that you think is important to the story. You're like, oh, this is going to come back to play or okay, well maybe they don't want to talk about that situation. So really, really good book. I can't wait to see like where this, like how it wraps up because I do think it makes a really good cinematic story. Um, if you're looking for something that is more of that drama serious kind of story, this is going to be, but not a heavy read, not like Sarah Lone, like we talk about where it's super, super in depth, um, constant reading. This is more on the light side where it is more of the like film noir shots and the, like the moment of the camera following stuff more than what they say it's what they do um this is an interesting one for that um from mad cave we have issue two of nature's labyrinth that has these super sick covers um with all the detail on it this book honestly like that's one of the biggest selling points to me is just how intricate the art gets um it is the story of seven people i believe I could have my number right. I think it's seven. Uh, who are brought and dropped into a maze. Here, I'm just going to show you that maze really fast. They're dropped into this massive maze. Uh, and it's kind of like the Hunger Games. They are being told that they have to fight each other. Only one person can make it out. You can make your alliances or whatever if you want. But that's not. it's not necessarily going to help you get through the maze. And inside of the maze, one woman teams up with this guy who's just absolutely going to die on day one he's just the weakest link in the whole thing and she teams up and starts carrying him literally through the maze um and helping him fight people fight people off we know that she might be some kind of secret agent or somebody because she practiced her lines so she's either a secret agent or a spy or something um because we saw her kind of deciding this is who i'm going to be and playing it out um, in issue one so we don't really know what her motivation is and why she's helping people but she is definitely the one that's like hey you don't have to fight people you don't have to die um, and so there goes like I don't want to anyway and so you get this unlikely duo trying to make their way through this maze and every twist and turn that you could possibly take um, happens it's literally like the Hunger Games where they are controlling it and they're like oh, we've got people in sector two and they think they're safe. Let's go ahead and, and cause something to happen in that area specifically. So it pushes them out and they go towards each other. And they had like the drop package where everybody had to go to the same spot to get their their drop. Um, just It's just a lot of fun. It's probably going to be four issues because most of the Mad Cave books recently have been. Um, but definitely if you like books or uh, movies like that or books like that this is going to be a good one to pick up and I'm really intrigued by all the characters and again I just love those covers um hell to pay issue two from image comics this is Charles Sewell's big universe that he is building out um this is one part of the um the shrouded college universe that he's building and in the hell to pay series we are seeing the first of our characters and our first introduction to the shrouded college which is an organization that will help you 
fix whatever problems you have, if you have an injury, if you need an education, if you need anything like that, they're here for you and they'll help you fix it. Uh, but then you are forever indebted to them for whatever. They tell you that it's a simple thing. They'll say like for these particular people, they needed to find some coins that demons were using to um, pass from hell up to earth. But the second they do it and they complete the mission, they tell them, oh, well, you didn't complete it to our specifications. And with the basically interest level of this activity, now you're going to owe us another, you know, I don't know, decade of your life. And if you don't do it, then we're going to take everything back and we're going to take you for We're going to ruin your life entirely, which definitely sounds exactly like trying to pay off anything from something that has college in the name. Um, but it's all demon related in this particular one. And this couple is trying so hard to find these missing coins and they're working with with and against demons to do it. And if they can find all of the mysterious coins, maybe they'll get to have their life back. Um, but they have very little time left to do it because the woman has just found out that she's pregnant. And if the Shrouded College finds out, they will take the baby and, and put it into their service forever. So a really cool universe that they're going to build out. This is one of those where it's like there's going to be six different series that all connect. They're all going to be related to, to the college and to the things that are going on in this demonist universe. So this is a big start to get into, but this is a good place to jump in, obviously, because it's only issue two of the new series. So... Um, up uh, next from also from image and also issue two i've hit my i have hit my issue twos for the week uh this is gospel and this story is all about a, a, t a small town way back when um and two kids who live in that town and both of them are working to be uh, part of the the lore of the town one one she's while she's a storyteller she knows that she was born to kind of be the the special savior in some way of this town and she thinks maybe it's through stories maybe it's through fighting for things uh, but she always runs to kind of be the knight in shining armor uh, very reminiscent of like a Joan of Arc kind of character and her best friend is Pitt who is also a storyteller and um, who is a apprentice to the the cloth he is supposed to be in training to work with the priests and the rabbis um, but he wants to be the, the historian, essentially, the person who takes care of their stories. And so while um, in issue one, their church was blown up and they are trying to figure out who did it and how to save the town. But they're also figuring out how to spin the story to give people hope. Um, what's also really, really interesting with their characters is Pitt has, this is at the time when the Bible was first translated into English. And Pitt has been giving the Bible to the the uh, citizens who have never had access to it before. And while the priesthood is adamantly against that, Pitt is secret, secretly stealing copies um, of it and handing it out to people and is getting into these fights with the people above him about whether or not the masses should have complete and total access to the word of God. Um, so he's trying to spread the good news in like capital G in and uh, his counterpart is trying to make up good news and keeps telling him uh, whatever the story we tell people, that's what they're going to believe. So let's make it a good one. And um, it's, it's such an interesting thing about what is truth and what is storytelling and what matters when you're telling a story. And so it's, a, it's another really like also like a really depth like deep story for writing there's a lot to it and you kind of have to pay attention to what you're reading but it's got a really interesting story along the way um uh, next also issue two also from image we had three of them back to back making it easy this is two graves um this is it's the story of a young woman who we believe from issue one that her mother has passed away and uh, she is on a mission to kind of help her, like, get to a place of rest, um, essentially. And in it, she is traveling with a Grim Reaper type character who we know is somebody who helps ferry people at least over to the side of the dead um, in, in, in his realm. And in this particular issue, um, they've made it through the first part of their road trip and they are now in... Uh, moving from one town to the next. And they pass through a town called Rowlett. 
and a raw light. Um, and it looks like it's a fine, like small town that seems to have like they eat at a diner and things are happening in it. Um, and then they get to the next town and she finds out that that town might not actually uh, still be in existence. But the whole time as well, they've got, they find out that there are some other demon Grim Reaper people chasing them. And she is being told by her her Grim Reaper friend that it's him that they're after and it has nothing to do with her and uh, she needs to like not worry about it. But then when they show up, the tables have turned and the conversation is completely different. And so now we have no idea who to trust after issue two um, and no idea who anybody is, who is working with the good guys, who are the good guys, what is going on with her and is she supposed to be passing over to the world of the dead herself or is she something completely different um i now get like that you know a little bit of the reference for the title two graves because we think she's supposed to be burying her mom but maybe she's supposed to be passing over to um i don't know if that's going to be what it comes out to play like comes into play at the end but i'm really excited to see if that's kind of the reference it's making or if there's going to be something else completely going on. Uh, we're only two issues in, so I still kind of don't know what's going on. Issue three is that turning point usually in comic books, uh, especially in a 12-part series. So I think we'll get something in issue three that's like, oh my god, like that kind of brings it all together. But there are some big moments in this issue that are already teasing towards that um, by issue two. So two graves, issue two. Always, always a good time to check out. I have so many people who come in who are like, oh, this one sounds interesting. And then they're like, oh, it's Image. Well, I've known for the last 30 years that I can usually trust that. And I'm like, you can. Um, there's always some good ones coming out from them. So uh, apparently three in a row on our stream tonight. Um, from Scout Comics, we have issue three of The Life and Death of the Brave Captain Suave. Uh, this is the story of a homeless man who believes that he is a superhero and so he is he sees the world as a comic book whenever we see through his eyes everything changes and we see him as like a, a batman or a superman kind of night like actual like 40s golden age superhero and in issue one he meets another he meets a kid who is probably a teenager probably in his early 20s and he is um homeless as well and he's kind of seems to have a problem um, with possible drug or alcohol addiction. Um, but Captain Swab takes him in and decides to make him his sidekick. And so in his eyes, he sees him as a little kid who dresses up like a Robin kind of situation. And they go on these adventures. And there have been some incredibly beautiful moments with the way Captain Swab sees the world. And there have been some hilarious ones where he saw some construction workers and he thought that they were bad guys and they were trying to attack something. And really it was like a barrel that they were moving, but he ran after them and he attacked them all. Um, and you see it again, play out like a superhero story in his eyes, but then in reality you are flashing back and seeing it. Um, great conversation, obviously about, um, mental health and, uh, but also a great conversation about how anybody can be a superhero if you just make the choice to help somebody else. Like even when he's being ridiculous, like the, his young sidekick is like, oh, um, okay, I, well, actually, what you just said makes a lot of sense. I'm glad you said that because it, it is important to help other people. And um, I love the little lessons that he teaches along the way. Like, even if it is kind of just ridiculous at some points, you get these great little moments. And so it does kind of feel like a modern version of a Golden Age comic. Also, um, I love the homage cover that they are doing on the next issue. Um, so... I, I think it's going to, I love that they're playing with this and the concept of all the different superheroes. So I can't wait to see what happens in the next issue, but uh, Scout's doing a great thing with this one. So don't miss it. Um, I know a lot of the Scout books that come out, if they're not the horror ones, I feel like a lot of people miss the non-horror books at Scout. So I feel it necessary to remind you, like, don't miss the non-horror Scout books because they're really good too. Um, from Comics Experience Publishing, we have issue two of Sparks of Chaos. This is a massive oversized book. Um, it's ginormous. And it is, it, so it is a little bit more expensive. These are $7.99. I have a feeling that um, you're going to get probably most of the story in three or four issues at most because of that. But um, much like their Past the Last Mountain series, I feel like we kind of see 
more than one story happening at the same time. Um, but our main our main story, this is so hard to find a page that I can show. Nope, nope, nope. There is a, a Hecate that is like half worm, half human. And so like her top half isn't covered. And I so I have to find a page that I can show. Um, but it takes place in ancient Greece. It follows a man. Um, I guess it takes place in modern society, but it's about ancient uh, Greek gods. It's a man who is a satyr who's still living in our time. And basically all of the gods have been can be killed and then brought back as different children and different people throughout time. And so um, in this particular one, since he is a satyr, he is charged with protecting the child who is going to become Dionysus once he grows up. And so we are seeing his adventure as he tries to get him to the place that he's supposed to be and get to safety. Um, and then he's got people who are helping him along the way. Um, this is Hermes, obviously, um, with the, with the flying hats and shoes. Um, and then he's got a woman who's helping him as well, who kind of feels like she got sucked into it, but it's kind of enjoying the adventure at this point. Um, and then we've got our young would-be Dionysus kind of trying to figure out where he fits into the whole story. He, uh, was kidnapped in issue one, and so they've been working to get him back. Um, all kinds of cool, interesting new ways to look at the gods and look at their stories. Um, I love the way they did the story of the golden apples. Uh, once again, though, I don't know if I can show you on this live stream. Um, but they did a really cool thing with the, the golden apples story and the three sisters who are supposed to be watching over them um, and Aphrodite's challenges. And so it's kind of cool because if you know Greek mythology, you get little twists and turns on stories that you've known for a long time. And if you don't know Greek mythology, you get to build out this new world with these characters that you um, are going to learn about in each issue. And again, you get a lot of a lot of story. You get your main story, but then you follow these different people. And then you kind of just see these other bits of mythology change to fit into the universe in a way that, oh, this is going to come into play in the next issue. Or maybe it came into play in the earlier part of the story. And it's like, oh, by the way, if you didn't know what that was, here's kind of our version of that backstory. So a fun way to get some Greek mythology in your life for adults, not for kids. Um, usually when we talk about things that are Greek mythology, people jump into like the Percy Jackson world and things like that. This is not, um, this is not that kid-friendly version. Um, from Opus Comics, issue two of Halloween Seekers of the Seven Keys, which if you're like me, you didn't know that Halloween was banned when you read issue one, but then you found out that they were and you didn't really need to know because the issue was just kind of cool and you uh, <laughs> are still in either way. So um, this is, I don't know if it connects in any way to their music. A lot of the Opus Comics do. Um, do they have anything called Seeker of the Keys? That Seekers of the Seven Keys is their big record. Seeker of, one of their big hit records. Okay, cool. So Seeker of the Seekers of the Seven Keys is one of their big records. And in this story, we've got two siblings. And uh, in issue one, they went to a flea market and they found some cool stuff. And they ended up in this secret world and found out that they were supposed to be on this journey to find these seven keys in order to restore balance. I just am here for this giant jack-o'-lantern guy who's super cool. Is he their mascot? Yeah. Okay. Um, cool. So he is Halloween's mascot. Um, <laughs> that makes sense. Um, but in this issue, uh, they've returned back to the world. They do have the first key that they found. And uh, the, the jack-o'-lantern has shown up to kind of chase after them and we can't tell if he's a good guy or a bad guy like there's a point where he says that he's their guardian but they're also like we want to stay away from him we don't really trust him um and so young boy getting beat up doesn't really like anything makes some bad choices in this issue his sister trying to protect him uh can't always be there for him and um his pumpkin king friend uh, also trying to just do his very best and this kid just makes all of the wrong choices all through this issue um, the whole time I'm like oh I'm on your side because you're getting bullied and I feel bad for you and then like the next thing he's like making terrible decisions and you're like why are you making that decision like I thought you wanted to be the seeker and you wanted to be cool like stop it um, it's a, I don't know why I'm so invested in this comic, but I'm so invested in this Halloween comic, uh, that I need to know what happens immediately for the next one. Um, I don't know, maybe I'm secretly a Halloween fan of this because I really like the storytelling of this. Are they one of those like 
over the top bands? Like, are they like a theatrical band, Matt? Is that why this feels so big? No, it's the same as Iron Maiden's universe. They're kind of a knockoff. I was like, isn't Iron Maiden kind of a theatrical band? Yes. Okay. They've, but they've got the Eddie, the mascot, and all the cool, you know, painted comic style art for every album. Got it. And Halloween kind of has the same thing, except they have Pumpkin Dude. He's really cool. I really like Pumpkin Dude. Like, he can, like, make, like, his roots, like, like shoot out and, like, grow to, like, catch people. I don't know. Pumpkin Dude, awesome. Um, just, you know, give me a spinoff of Pumpkin Dude's, like, origin story. I'm here for that. Um, uh, also from Opus Comics, we have issue two of Eternal Descent. Um, once again, if there is a heavy metal band that is connected to this one, I don't know it. Uh, obviously, heavy, heavy metal is not uh, my history uh, trivia facts that I know. Ram so. says he's a metal fan. Yeah, Ram, you should totally. I'll have to get you a copy of one and two for your box of Halloween if you're a Halloween fan because you'll love it. Um, I don't know if this is a band. Ram, is Eternal right. Descent a band? Yeah, if you are watching, or if you're anybody else, if you're watching and you know is Eternal Descent is a band, um, probably a metal band, let me know. Um, but this is also an Opus comic, so usually it is. I'm trying to see, like, does it say on the inside? Um, it doesn't say. Um, or maybe it does, and I don't know who any of these people are. Anyway, uh, in this particular story, uh, we have a young girl whose father has passed away, and she does, she, he was, like, hunting these ruins, and he was doing different stuff, and she doesn't know what any of them are, and she starts looking into it, and she ends up kind of in a battle with... These Thor and Loki type characters, um, I mean, honestly, they're just Thor and Loki. Like, he calls himself the God's Mischief. And uh, they're all coming after a guitar that she has. That when she plays the ruins uh, as notes on the guitar, magical things happen. And she is trying to find her dad. She really just wants to get back to a place where maybe her dad can still exist or maybe she could like honor him or be with him in some way and she is not listening to anybody and making terrible decisions but she's rocking out on a guitar and she looks really cool when uh um you know when she does it so she's like hey I'm just gonna do what I can and uh her dad's best friend is kind of stepping in and telling her like hey you don't know what all of this was you don't know about the darkness um but you also don't know about your birthright, and I'm I'm here to kind of like be the Giles to your Buffy. Let me tell you all about this. And she doesn't want to hear it because she wants to believe that her dad is coming back for her. Um, so this is another one that's really fun, uh, just like classic uh, adventure story of like, oh, I've gotta I've gotta do this thing, and you as a reader are like, no, that's not the thing you need to do. Stop doing that thing, and just listen to the one person who is telling you all of the things you need to know. Um, and yet you still follow along and you get excited about it. And, uh, now I want to know if, uh, these ruins actually translate to the same notes on the guitar that she's saying they do, but, um, that's a question for somebody that knows more than me. Um, nothing more metal than creating a comic series about your band's mascot. Yes. Uh, oh, uh, Ram says Eternal Descent is a fictional band. He looked it up. That's cool too. Yeah. Thanks Ram for looking that up. I'm going to take a drink of this while you guys talk about metal. Yeah, that's awesome. Good to learn. Um, from Boom Studios, we have issue six of Grimm. I cannot believe we're already at six, and yet at the same time can't believe we're only at six. I feel like I've been reading this book my whole life. Um, this is, in a good way, by the way. Um, this is from Stephanie Phillips, who um, I really love. I love everything she does. She also lives really close to our store. So, Stephanie Phillips, if you want to come down, we're happy to have you. Just going to say. Um, but if you haven't started Grimm, Grimm is the story of, of a, a group of Grim Reapers. Um, we find out that there is more than one Grim Reaper. It's actually a very corporatized position. And in issue one, a young girl who works as a Reaper uh, ends up having a situation where... She messes up everything. She loses her sight. People, humans see her, and we find out that there's kind of like a special situation going on with her. Um, and over the last couple of issues, we found out like who she, we have not found out who she is. I guess we've kind of found out who she is. We know a little bit more about her um, lineage and why she has some of the special things that do. But we also found out that everybody in the underworld is out to get her. 
And so she is on the run right now and we are dealing with some stuff. And every time I think, oh, cool, we're getting towards like a point where they're going to wrap it up in this particular arc or in this particular like problem that she's facing, the problem just gets even worse. So I really, really feel bad for her and I want to keep learning more about her character. Um, I want to dive further into this corporatized master of death situation um, and I want to just keep building out this world. I hope it's like something is killing the children where the first volume was kind of just like, oh, we're going to go on this adventure and we're going to solve this particular case and then it's like, oh, people really like this. Let's make it even bigger and I hope we get a big world out of this. Um, as it continues to grow because there's definitely a lot of room for this to just inflate incredibly and I think Boom was putting a lot of stock in that as an idea at the very beginning and I hope they keep with it. Um, that's issue six. So I imagine a volume one trade will be coming soon. Um, also hitting its issue six and kind of and wrapping up possibly this volume uh, I think it actually says end of book one at the end is a star hinge book one the dragon and the boar by Liam Sharp and it's on image comics and Liam is doing everything uh for this book the writing the art all of it and uh this has been a crazy series I'm just gonna show you some of this like art to start with before I even jump into like what this is about but um this is one of the most high fantasy meets high sci-fi books that I have read and I don't again I did not mean that in a bad way at all I cannot this is another one of those books that I can't stop trying to piece it all together and getting more and more invested in what's happening um it is a King Arthur story and it is actually follows Merlin who is a mer person from the future or possibly another planet um, and he is, I think it's the future. Anyway, he comes back to help Arthur and everything. And you get the whole, um, Uther Pendragon, you get the whole Arthurian legacy. Um, but at the same time, we're following a woman in the future, in the, like our time period. And we're kind of learning about her magical family past and everything that she's been into. She's kind of like, oh, I'm just really into Wicca. But then it turns out that she's actually way more connected to more magic and there's more happening with her and uh we learned some big stuff about that in this particular issue um and i love this because she just drew on her like own picture while telling you about her story like nerdy girl like and like all this stuff um but this one the first five issues leave you really really confused constantly about where we are in the story and what's going on and it's kind of Again, not in a bad way. And this one opens up and is like, basically, let me tell you the story so far. And gives you this big history lesson of everything. And then she's narrating and is like, okay, now that you know the actual history, let me tell you about where we are and where we're going and what's going to happen. And, and then she kind of gives you her, her family history and um, it's it's such a cool book and it's such a great concept and Liam's just playing with art at this point and mixing it up and so I'm um, really curious to see the the way that it, this volume one lets like ends I was like oh man like I thought we were gonna wrap up and I was gonna be like oh cool okay I got my everything I need out of that story and then you get to the end and I was like well that was exactly how I want you to write a cliffhanger because now I'm really invested in whatever's going to happen in volume two. So um, Star Hinge, Dragon and the Boar, book one. This is issue six. Um, eventually, we're probably going to see a trade. I have no idea how long that's going to take, though. So if you're like, I can't wait, just, just dive in now and grab the six issues and you don't have to wait to figure out what's going on. Um, from Boom Studios... We have issue five of Wind, The Throne in the Sky. Um, this is by James Tynion, and uh, it has just, it's, if you haven't read Wind, this is this is volume, I think we decided it's volume three today. Yes. Um, this is, it's, it's an amazing story. This was, the first volume was um, a fan favorite for everybody that I ever met. Um, it's the story of a young boy who lives in a town that doesn't believe that magic should exist. And anything that has the smallest bit of magic connected to it, they literally destroy. 
And in volume one, we find out that the king is dying and the young prince has agreed to, in his father's eyes, keep up that non-magical world. But in his own, he's decided he's going to let magic in as long as he doesn't have to do anything with it. Um, in We've kind of gone on since then and Wind and his friends have kind of been all tussled up into the war and they've made allies with this prince and they're all on the run and there's a great war between fairies and vampires and humans and everything is getting crazier and more and more out of control and James Tynion just wants to see how often he can make you cry with fictional characters um and he does it so wonderfully well um but what I love about what James does in this is that everybody has a completely different opinion on how the, the magical blood should be handled and how we should view people who are magical. And then the people who say they're for it aren't always actually 100% for it. And then there's some people who are willing to die for um, what they believe in and there's an, on all sides. And then there's people who are like, look, I support you um, and I love you, but like I don't actually want to be near you. Um, and it's such an interesting dynamic. And we see it with every age. I love that we see it with the kids. We see it with the adults. We see it with the way the war is working. Um, it's just, this is, honestly, this is what fantasy books are supposed to do. They're what they're supposed to be. Um, and this is, a, a, honestly, like if somebody ever puts this in novel form, this would probably be a New York Times bestseller YA novel, young adult novel. Um, but it is a fantastic graphic novel, and I won't be surprised if we're still talking about this one decades from now as one of those books that just, oh, you you didn't read Wind? Like, you have to go back and read Wind. Like, you're going to need the omnibus. Like, you're going to like you're gonna want it. You're going to have to have it on your shelf. What would you say? Like saga. Yes, like Saga. Or even I Hate Fairyland, how people are like, uh, I Hate Fairyland's five volumes in, and everybody's like, I have the omnibus, I have the individual trades, I have the single issues. I think this is going to be one of those that, we're talking about four decade, uh, decades later where you're like, oh, my God, that book was the most impactful. They're going to be children who, when they grow up, they're like, the first comic I read was Wind and it changed my life. Um, so I can't wait. I cannot wait. So when you're that kid, please come tell me because I need to talk to you about that. Um, wrapping up this week, and I almost cried when I got to the thing and it said the end, um, is Jonna and the Unpossible Monsters. It's from Oni Press. Ooh. And it's issue 12, and seriously, um, I'm not okay with the fact that it ended. Uh, but I am okay with this all red cover, because this is dope. Um, I love, love, love this cover so much. I, As soon as I took it out of the box, I, I sent a picture to Wednesday Phil, who does the show a lot, um, and was like, dude, did you check out this Jonna all red cover? Like, it's so good. Um, and then we, we sent gifts back and forth about how much we love it. Um, but this book has been amazing. It's done by a couple, um, the Samney couple, a husband and wife, who wanted to make a book for their daughters. And one is the older sister who's bossy and always on top of things. And the other is the younger sister who would rather just smash things than figure them out. Um, it has had some of the best art the whole way through. Um, and a beautiful story about these two sisters kind of, wanting to keep together no matter what, no matter what monsters come their way, no matter what people get in their way. They're just trying to work together to keep each other safe. And if they happen to find their parents along the way who've gone missing, like that would be a great thing to them. But as long as they're together, uh, they're, they're fine. And, um, there was a beautiful, uh, I thought there was another spread in here that I was like, I have to make sure I show that one. And, um, Oh, even this one's fantastic, the, the center page. Uh, the, this issue, I literally cried. Um, there's some stuff that happens between Jonna and her sister. And uh, one of the things I love is that Jonna doesn't really speak. She's almost completely nonverbal. And so her sister is always trying to, to um, be a representation for her and help her along the way. And yet Jonna is the strong one physically who's always trying to help her sister and make sure that Nothing happens to her. And um, she's always running out and fighting monsters and sacrificing herself in the moment to make sure that her, her older sister is safe. 
and um, it's absolutely beautiful book. It's a great, great, great story for young readers because it does have that balance of a lot of, uh, of some dialogue and then non-dialogue scenes. So you can just, you get those silent pages where you can kind of learn to infer from what's happening. But as an adult reader, when you get to those silent pages, they are some of the most heartfelt, tugging on your emotions pages you're gonna get. This has been a phenomenal book. Um, quite honestly, it's one of the books that made me, go, like, since Scott Pilgrim, it's probably one of the big books that's been, made me go, okay, we need to pay attention to what Omi Press is putting out. Um, and it's so good. So if you didn't read John and the Impossible Monsters, there is a, um, volume one and volume two trade, I believe. Um, I want them, since it's only 12 issues, I hope they put it all together in one though at some point. Um, all right, we got some number ones. First up from Legends Publishing. We've got Bone Check. I have to uh, look at that like several times um, because I always want to say Bone Cheek, but it's definitely not Bone Cheek. Um, this is an interesting story. Um, I'm like, who does it really follow? It follows kind of a couple people, but I guess the main character is, is this particular guy. And uh, he is a mercenary who goes to this bar and it's kind of reminded me of Deadpool because they go to the bar and he's sitting there drinking and then like the pool of options of people he could go after come up and they're like what's it gonna be um what I do love about it this art is fantastically colored I love the orange and black and red and that being kind of the only tones that it is but it's so cool because it's written in prose format a lot of the time and then blends in the comic dialogue at the same time and so, like, you'll get some pages that are completely either narration or actual speech bubbles, and then you'll go to the next page, and it's um, almost entirely prose over the course of the two pages. So, um, we follow him. He ends up taking a case, and he has to go out on it. Um, and, oh my gosh, I just want to show you every page. Um, he goes out on this case, and he gets in the taxi that is hired by the company, and the taxi driver is an undead taxi driver. And he's like, oh, where's it going to be? Like, what's going on? And you get a really funny story with the taxi service and the way that guy is. Um, I'm literally just flipping to almost every page of this book at this point. Um, honestly, like, the art draws you in and it keeps you, like, focusing. I was reading this uh, the other day and I didn't know it was going to be a prose book a lot of the time. And so I started to get to... The point where I was like, oh my gosh, like I, I'm not, I'm not getting all the information that I want to get. So I like stopped and went back and like waited until I was really awake so I could pay attention to all the pros and detail because I didn't want to miss anything about this guy. Um, we don't really know anything about him yet. We don't really know anything that's going on, but we do know that he's on a mission um, and he is going to take some people out and it's going to be kind of crazy. So if you're looking for a new publisher and you kind of like that darker art, um, this is going to be a good one for you. I just, I put this in like three people's boxes this week and was like, I don't know, the art screams your name. I hope the story does too. So check it out. New publishers are always fun. Um, uh, from Red 5, we've got Machine Girl's holiday special. Um, I didn't know who Machine Girl was. And uh, I got this issue and I was like, oh, I guess I should probably look up who Machine Girl was. And guess what? They did all that work for you, which I super appreciate. Um, it's like they knew that you might not know who Machine Girl was. So the first couple pages of the issue are actually just her. Um, I went too far. Are literally her telling you who she is and what all of her other books are called and what they're about and where you should start if you want to get to know who she is. Um, she is a half human, half android, I guess not half, half, half. She is part human, part android cyborg situation. Um, and she was made in a lab. And this is kind of just some stories about different holidays. It starts with a Halloween story, actually, um, where she wants to hear some scary stories. And she tells her, her dad, the man who raised her from, from a little android human cyborg thing. A, she asks him to tell her a story and he tells her this really dark story about his time working uh in the lab and uh, how all of these people like were tormented and destroyed by a worm that either caused you to have visions of the darkest thing that you could imagine or gave you visions of 
um, the perfect utopia, and then when the worm crawled out and you were no longer in that utopia, like, people just, like, clawed their eyes out or, like, went crazy. And she's like, that's not really how I thought this story was going to go. I don't think I'm ever going to sleep again. And then he, she's, she's an android, so he just pushes the button and she goes to sleep. Um, and then we get some Christmas stories for her. Um, and it's, it's fun if you are, um, if you're into the kind of stories like, like that with the androids and just want some one-off holiday stories about a young girl who's a robot, um, human hybrid, who's also like, I'm not going to show you that page, who also like, look, dresses up like Santa Claus and goes in like destroy stuff. Um, it kind of feels like a dynamite comic in the storytelling and the art. So if you are a fan of, you know, Purgatory or like uh, Red Sonia or even Vampirella, like this is probably going to be a book that you would enjoy. And it's oversized and has a nice, strong, glossy cover. 48 pages of three holiday stories. And only $5.99. That's kind of surprising. I'm going to save this for the end of this section. I'm going to save this for right before that. I have so many things. Uh, up next, since we're talking holiday stories, we've got Happy Horror Days from the Chilling Adventures line of Archie Comics. Um, I'm Matt's gonna I'm gonna spoil it all for you. I'm so sorry, but this was fantastic. Um, this is there's three stories in here, as there so often is in Chilling Adventures or Archie Christmas stories. Um, I love the paper quality they use for the cover, but the first one is um, a Betty Monster Hunter story. I love when Betty is a monster hunter, and in it she is trying to chase down Krampus and she thinks that they need to go after Krampus and she's got Archie and she's dragging along with her and uh, Jughead's like, hey, have you ever heard my Krampus story? And they're like, no, what's your Krampus story? And she's like, she's like, because I don't really have time for this. I have to go after Krampus. And he's like, I promise you, you don't have to go after Krampus. Listen to my story. And it's all about how Jughead, the hunger, uh, goes after the werewolf that he is, goes after Krampus because he's in his way. Um, and messing stuff up. And then we get the Yule Cat story. Um, if you don't know the Yule Cat story, that is an actual creature. Um, we actually had Drew Edwards, the creator of Halloween Man, at our old shop at Christmas time telling us about, um, monsters. And he told us all about the Yule Cat and, uh, from Iceland and all of the crazy stuff that it does. And this is a great story for that. And for Veronica and all of the terrible people who are bullying somebody, um, getting what they deserve from a giant, beautiful cat that I want to snuggle. Um, and then the last story is about, speaking of people who need to get what they deserve, it's about Reggie being a jerk and uh, completely rude to an elf who he doesn't realize is an elf that, like, a, a Christmas fairy, I guess I should say, uh, who comes and grants his wish to help him. And Reggie, oh, my God, I can't even show you. <laughs> I guess I can show you that. It's not the spoiler for the end. Reggie uh, doesn't, doesn't ever show any at all decency towards another human being, and they register that about them, and they decide that Reggie should get everything that's coming to him. And so I love this. I love the, the moderately uh, dark horror to completely dark horror of Archie Holiday. Um, this was fantastic. So if you want a horror version of Christmas, which is what most Christmas stories are, are honestly, if you go through old folklore, this is going to be uh, your perfect one. And it's Archie, so it's amazing. Um, speaking of kind of horror for Christmas, uh, we have Leonide the Vampire, A Christmas for Crows. Um, and this is a one-shot. It's part of that uh, Mike Mignola at Dark Horse life. Uh, we had Leonide before uh, Halloween, I believe it was. She had another one shot. And basically, she's a small child who was turned into a vampire. And every issue so far, both of the ones that I've read, have opened up with Leonide being awoken um, and her casket being opened and people like them thinking, oh, it's a sweet little girl. And then her whole town, like the whole town being destroyed by this vampire, um, who is like, I'm not a sweet little girl. I'm a vampire. Like, what did you think was going to happen? Um, and in this story, Leonide, um, is being chased by this. She's always being chased by this skeletal priest. And in this particular one, they kind of go head to head for a while and things don't work out really well for him. Um, the story gets 
gets a little dark, and honestly, she gets a little lonely, and she is visited by some ghosts, and she has kind of, like, her own, like, she thinks it's going to be a Christmas Carol moment, but it's it's kind of not. Um, I love it because, again, you think it's going to be one thing. It's constantly changing, but uh, I love... I love, I just love this, this cool art and this little girl vampire and all of her moments and just how she kind of celebrates Christmas on her own and how she turns it into a thing. Uh, if you're, I, I know I have a lot of people who are like, oh, I want to know how to get into something like Hellboy or I'm looking for something similar to that, but I don't want to go into the massive universe. Uh, Leonide is one of those where it's like, it's not necessarily Hellboy, but it is Mignola. And so it kind of gives you a feel for what that universe might feel like if you, if you jumped into it. And it's a one shot. Um, I love it. Oh, yes. Thank you. I can have a drink of wine. And what are we drinking? It says Volde. It's a cab salve. Again, it's from our, our subscriber and friend Jamie, and it's um, Moldavon Cabernet. Moldavon? I, I don't know what that means. Um, <laughs> but it's, uh, it's a cab salve. It came out of Jamie's advent calendar, um, which is fantastic, and um, it's, it's, it's really good. It has a protected geographical indication. What does that mean? I don't know either. But you can scan to discover more. So maybe next time I need to scan the QR code on the back to learn more about the bottle of wine before. Um, and I think that's because it did come out of the advent calendar. So it's a mini bottle, which is also cool. But it kind of gives you a chance to like learn more about the wine so you know which ones to go back and pick. Uh, so thanks, Jamie. I don't know if I've said thanks at all. I just keep saying Jamie gave it to us. Um, also from Dark Horse, we have issue one of Assassin's Apprentice. Um, I thought this was going to be another one that was like from the world of something because it kind of looks like a video game on the cover. So I thought maybe this was a video game. Might still be. Don't know. Um, but this is the story of a young boy who is dropped off. Uh, in a kingdom and he's dropped off kind of at, uh, with this man who takes him into a bar and says hey this is the son of the prince and in this world everybody's kind of named by their virtues and they kind of are supposed to live up to it and it's prince oh my gosh what is his name prince chivalry prince chivalry is the one who has the bastard son and they're like well that doesn't seem like it makes sense and they're like well here we are he has a son and of course his wife is lady patience and so they're like oh well we can't we can't cause this to test the lady we don't want to do that like she's already more than lived up to her name so they make the little boy sleep because the man doesn't know what else to do he leaves the, the man the little boy to sleep with the dogs in the stable because uh, he thinks living, leaving him with any of the soldiers or in the soldiers' quarters would be a terrible idea. So he leaves him with the dogs. And at night he has these beautiful dreams that are super bright and colorful of him with the dogs. And then the dogs become his protectors. He bonds with one of them. And he finds out that they think that he should come to the castle and he needs to be a part, like the, a part of things. And the prince doesn't feel the same way. Um, but the king and the king to be don't really care. So he is sent to live at the castle and things are going to shape up from there. Um, it seems like he might have a little bit of magic, um, or at least has, uh, something going on special with him. So I'm kind of curious to see what's going to happen. And we still don't know necessarily who the assassin is. So I don't know who he's apprenticing for, but I'm very curious because I really like the characters in this. Um, sometimes in the fantasy books, I'm like, oh, that was a lot of like the knights and this and that. And I'm not sure if that's the direction I want to go in. Um, but this one seems to be very, very character driven and all of the characters have been uh, written really well. So I'm excited to see what that's going to do and where that's going to play out for them. And I really want to know more about this little boy because he doesn't really get to speak a lot at all in the issue. Um, ex but he has the narration a lot of times about his relationship with the dogs and how he feels and how he feels about things. So, um, and I'm not sure who the overall narrator is now that I think about it. So I'm really curious how this is going to play out because there are a lot of layers to this book that haven't actually like unfolded at all yet. 
So I'm, I'm definitely in. Um, honestly, I think if you're enjoying something like Dark Knights of Steel, this is going to be an indie book that you can fall into that's going to have a similar feel. Um, and it's issue one, so now it's time to pick it up. Uh, Stevie's is Merry Christmas, and I want to say happy birthday, Stevie. Um, that was like two days ago, I think. So happy birthday, buddy. I hope it was an awesome day. Uh, thanks for tuning in. And, and of course, Merry Christmas and happy holidays. Um, from Image Comics, we have issue one of Night Club, which is Mike, uh, Mark Millar's new one. And that's not in any way, shape, or form connected to anything else. Usually when we get the new Mark Millar, we're like, oh, this is connected to his spy universe, or this is this. This is a new story, and the coolest part about the whole thing is that it is a dollar ninety nine, and every issue is going to be a dollar ninety nine, and I think that is amazing. Um, we don't see a lot of dollar ninety nine adult comics anymore. A lot of the kids books will still come out at a dollar ninety nine, but to have a dollar ninety nine adult title, super cool. And um, this is the story of a young boy, a teenage boy, I should say who is like, hey, I want to be a celebrity, but I want to do it like a YouTube star. So I'm just going to do a bunch of stupid stunts. And uh, if I get hurt in the process, like that's cool because people will give me more views and I'll get sponsorships. And um, first stunt he tries to do is he thinks he's going to ride his bike across rooftops and uh, downtown in the city. And a dude hits the edge and falls down and breaks his back in like five spots and ends up in the hospital. And his mom not sure what to do, calls this line of a detective who's looking to help people. Like He's like, I can save your people if you um, let them come work for me. And uh, we find out that the detective is a vampire. And the way he saves all these kids is by turning them into vampires. And um, he tells them he's got a special task force. He's trying to get people, again, to help him out. They're supposed to be using their powers for good, kind of basically becoming superheroes, um, and working for the positive things, and there's more to it that he won't tell us, and there's some secret information uh, that seems bad, and uh, this kid is like, guess what? <laughs> I'm going to be famous on YouTube, <laughs> and so he hasn't changed at all, even with his second chance at life so far. Our main character is kind of like, yeah, bro, but like, what if I just did cool stunts on YouTube because now I can't get hurt because I'm a vampire, so... Um, it's going to be interesting. I think this book's going to be really funny. I think we're going to see more of that uh, Dave kick-ass kind of storytelling that we saw. We're going to see more of a character like that who's like um, growing into who he is while also growing into these newfound powers. And I think we're going to get a, probably a dark world that comes out of it after that. But so far this issue was, was pretty funny and also had a really good story. And once again easy to see turning into a movie or a TV show. So, uh, hey, Uncle Jim, thanks for watching. I hope you're okay. Can't wait for you to um, come hang out with us. So, uh, um, from Boom, we've got book one of A Vicious, Cy a vicious Circle. Um, and did not know this book was coming in in prestige, like magazine format, and totally threw me off when it came in. Um, but... I had so many people coming in asking for this book this week, and I'm not surprised. When I read it, I was like, oh, this makes sense. Um, for one, it's a Lee Bermejo on art, and if you're a fan of um, any of the Batman stories and stuff that have been happening recently, like, I just love this. It starts out with a planet, and it gets bigger and bigger, and then it is the guy's eye the whole time. Um, as he's waking up so it's like oh you know this is the way the world works and it grows bigger and bigger and then it's just actually somebody's eye as they awake waken um but this is a story of a man um and it starts out as the story of a man and his son and his wife um as we're at the time of segregation and he's trying to just kind of deal with his life he uh and teach his son that you know there's going to be a lot of people in this world that hate him and that things aren't ever going to work out the way they want and he's kind of trying to be positive and teach his son those things um and kind of be a good dad and he tells him though he has to go to work and that the only rule is that the son isn't allowed to go in the basement and because and he asks him why and he's like because the monster's down there and then we meet the monster and the monster is this man who is just threatening to kill him and telling him all these bad things. Um, and then, as one would expect, 
bad things immediately happen. And uh, we find ourselves in a story about two people who have traveled through all of time, essentially trying to kill each other. Um, and every time they wake up in a different world and they're in a different situation. And at the end of the day, the whole thing is they have to kill each other. Uh, one of them has to kill the other. And if they don't, the world may end. If they do, the world may also end. Maybe the world won't. Um, we're learning a little bit about who's who and who might be the good guy and who might be the bad guy, but also like what is right and what is wrong has become a big jumbled mess as these two are on uh, their vicious circle, which I love. I was like, oh, like he's like talking about it. I'm like, okay, I see where you're going with this. The vicious circle is going to be this like rotating pattern that y'all are stuck in and how life is terrible. And, um, you know, these are just two assassins essentially like constantly stuck in this in this circle of what's right what's wrong who needs to die who's gonna die what's gonna happen and uh is life always gonna be something that we can't control uh this is issue one it is going to it's not it's not just a one shot i know a lot of times when we see the prestige format books we think oh it's just one and done uh because that's how a lot of the indie ones are this is not this is i and i believe that all of them are going to be this size so if you decide to jump in know that going in. I know everybody says, what am I supposed to do with it, Shannon? Where do I put it? How do I put this in my my short box? I have nowhere to store it. Sometimes you just got to deal with that because the book is good. And this is definitely one of those where the art is good. The story is good. You're going to love it. Um, it's boom. It's one of those that they're actually like really pushing to. So, you know, there's going to be a lot coming in the story that you want to get into. Yeah, it's a little bit bigger. But you can put it sideways in your long box or short box along the side of the comics. You can buy a magazine short box, um, which good luck right now because I know that's hard to find. Um, but you could put them on a bookshelf. You can put them somewhere. But, you know, lay them down flat, whatever you need to do. But you gotta you got to take the chance and read these because a lot of the big books in this prestige format get missed and uh it's a shame don't don't miss them just because they're awkwardly sized and you don't know where to put them um and publishers literally i hear that every day so if you're a comic publisher and you're like oh why didn't that book sell as much as i thought just so you know people panic when they see prestige format um just gonna say um, up next from CEX Comics Experience Publishing, we have Act One of Three of Saga of a Doomed Universe, and um, I am still only halfway halfway ish through this book uh, because this one is definitely one where I need to read it and I need to read it with nobody talking to me and I want to pay attention to it. Um, but this is, you can see, this is a Watchmen homage cover, and there is a reason for that. This um is a, a story from a comic creator who says um, he hijacked this story to tell you all about um, a comics industry conspiracy that started in 1984 and ended in blood and fire. Um, so there's a reason for the Watchmen connection um, in the cover. We also have a very Watchmen-esque superhero team, and I love the narrator because the narrator is like, I'm not going to even tell you who these people are. I'm not going to talk to them. Like, you shouldn't talk to them. There's no reason in talking to superheroes because they all are ridiculous and they think they're better than you and they're not listening when you talk anyway. Um, and then they have some of their dialogue and the narrator's like, see, I told you, they're ridiculous. They say things like that and they think that it matters. <laughs> like, what is going on? Um, it's very reminiscent of some of the stuff that we read in Watchmen as... Um, as part of the story. And I think that we're gonna see how that comes into play very much so when you get to the second half of this book. I have not gotten there yet. I don't know what the thing is that we're trying to stop. I don't know what dooms the universe, but I do know that I like this art and that this story is deep. It's a, it is $8.99 for this issue. It's a very, it's a, once again, it's an oversized issue. There's a lot to it. This is one of those books where you're going to pay $8.99, but you're going to get a square bound book that gives you a lot of story and a lot that you pour over. Um, I have a feeling that this is going to be one that um, once it's over, like in three months from now, people are going to be like three months after the whole thing's over, people are going to come in and they're going to say like, hey, did you ever hear about this? This book, Saga of a Doom Universe, I feel like I hear about it on all these podcasts and I didn't grab it and I want to know if it's there. So be the one who grabs it. 
um, and looks into that. But yeah, this is, it's, I, I cannot wait. I wish I had read the whole thing, but I'm also really happy that I didn't because I don't want to spoil anything because what I did read so far, I was like, oh, this is going to be a good story. Um, and I just want to read the art. I just literally picked it up when I was uh, coming to do the live stream and was like, I didn't get to read this whole thing, but look at it. And Matt was like, oh, my God, like, I love the way that looks. I want to read it. Um, so that'll probably be what we do during Christmas uh, break. Mm -hmm. Um, and then lastly, this is from Tin Sky Comics, which is Austin Janowski's Tin as in like Tin Roof. Um, from, this is Austin Janowski's publishing company. Um, and Austin was kind enough to leave a few of these issues for us here. This is uh, his zombie story. And it is all about three kids who are stuck in, it's actually called zombies. Uh, uh, we're human too. Um, this is, it's three people, three kids, like teenagers who are stuck in a zombie apocalypse and they get to the top of this building and they're like, oh, there's not really anywhere we can go. We're kind of stuck here for a minute. What do we do with our time? And then one of the other kids is like, hey, you know, do you ever think about like, if we're, we're people and we have lives and if we became zombies, like obviously like we have a before life, like all of these people probably do too. Do you ever wonder like what their life was before? And so they each take turns telling a story about one zombie they see out of the crowd. And um, they have different art uh, art teams or creative teams in general behind each of the stories in this. So for each person who tells the story, we get a different creative team. And the first story is all about a kid who doesn't even notice the zombie apocalypse because he's too busy texting on his phone while he's walking down the street. And all these zombies are chasing him and he's kind of just like talking and texting and doesn't realize that the world is ending around him. Um, and then we get... The second story is all about um, a guy who is a complete klutz and works in a lab and trips and mixes a bunch of chemicals together. And they're like, oh, don't worry, it'll be fine. And then the zombie outbreak starts. Um, and then the third story is fantastic because um, it is about one of the zombies that they see out there who is actually a mime. And I love this story because he is, he's, uh, you know, he's mime. So even as the zombie apocalypse is starting, his whole story, of course, is silent. And you see him get dressed and go out and, like, he's just doing his mime life thing and enjoying the day and then notices all the zombies. And I love some of the paneling as he realizes, like, there's no way out of the situation um, let's see, like when he's realizing that like there's no way out of this zombie apocalypse and he's going to um, definitely get bitten and become a zombie. I love, I just love the mind faces for it. Uh, what a great way to do a zombie story um, to have kids kind of imagine what they think the zombies were beforehand and to and the mime it just gets me every time so we have these in stock at the store um this is the first part of it and i believe we're three volumes in for this story um but if you want to come in and check it out and support a local creator this is a great way to do that um with zombies we're human too uh those are the uh books that came out this week that are not necessarily picks of the week I honestly could have made like half of those picks of the week um, because there's so many good books but I have three because I have to narrow it down because I can't talk about all of the books as picks of the weeks because then you'll never believe me when I say something is my pick of the week and also we would be here until two o'clock in the morning because I would not stop talking about books so my three picks of the week this week um from boom studios issue two of specs is out um, you can just probably go ahead and write Specs down as my pick of the week every week it comes out because it is written by David Boer, who is the writer on Canto, which is one of my all-time favorite comic books. Um, and the artist is Chris Sheehan, and you know that we love them. They are amazing. And, um, the artist of The Autumnal, the artist of one of the stories in Nightfall, um, from Vault, but now doing this awesome book with Boom. This is the story of two boys who live in a small town who really want to have some kind of adventure. And they 
want to get some of those like magic glasses out of the back of a comic book kind of as a joke and one night they just show up and um they are supposed to be wish fulfillment glasses and in issue one they wish that the bully would leave them alone and he disappears and issue two is dealing with the fallout of that and how that's going to affect each of the boys and what they're going to go through and it's it's like hey what if we what if we just wish him back? What if we wish that the town forgot about him? What if we wish something completely different? Um, and then they think they got away with uh, the whole situation because nobody's talking about it for a moment. And they're like, well, I kind of feel a little bad because nobody cares. And then one day uh, they are watching the news and they see that it's been reported that uh, this boy has gone missing. And now they're all being investigated. Um, everybody's being called in and... Uh, interrogated by the principal and the police are going to get involved. And of course, one of our characters in the story is, is a young black boy, one of our main characters. And he's like, Hey, this is going to play out completely different for me than it is for anybody else. And uh, we do see how that affects the story um, as it goes on. But this is, it's such a good book already. I cannot wait to see where this goes. And every time they make a wish, I'm, i I think I read 8 billion genies long enough now that every time they make a wish, I'm like, you didn't word it right. Like, they're going to do, they're not getting it what you said. They're not going to get what you got, like, you really want out of it. You got to learn how to use your wish properly. Like, didn't you guys read 8 billion genies? Come on. So, uh, you know, if you ever get any kind of wish fulfillment opportunity in your life, uh, please read 8 billion genies where Charles Sewell, the attorney, teaches you how to legally write your wishes in a way that you don't get screwed um, because this isn't going to work out well for anybody and a uh, monkey's paw situation is not even going to be half of it but issue two of specs read it it's going to be great um once again fantastic job chris and david uh and for the second time uh crashing from idw's original imprint it, it, this is issue four crashing is another one that might just become one of those things that's a pick of the week for me every time. Um, I I cannot stop gushing about this book when people ask me what it is. Um, it is incredible. It is the story of a woman who is a doctor. She's a, a surgeon in the ER. And in issue one, some superheroes are brought into her hospital, which I totally didn't even remember that by the end of the story because it's not really the most important thing. Um, but some superheroes are brought in and nobody will help them. They don't believe that superheroes should be treated in the same hospitals. They don't want um, to kind of messy up everything. And she's like, well, I'm a doctor. I signed an oath. I'm going to do this. So she helps them anyway. And now she's kind of stuck on their case. Well, as the world doesn't want superheroes around and doesn't want anything going on like that, we find out that the reason why is because somebody is pushing for a bill to pass that kind of segregates superheroes away from everybody. And that somebody is her husband. So she has to go home and tell him that she's working on all these superhero things. Meanwhile, we find out she's also being forced to be the surgeon for uh, the mob. And she's the surgeon of the, the head of the mob and he keeps trying to use her and abuse her as his personal surgeon. And on top of that, we learn that she's an addict and she hasn't used in a long time. But knowing that she's helping superheroes and if they die, it could be cataclysmic to the world and trying to keep it off from her husband and deal with everything going on with him and trying to save the lives of the mob people so that he doesn't come after her husband. Um, she ends up using again. And um, this the way that they blend addiction in here and... Um, just not even addiction to the drugs, but the addiction to the adrenaline and the addiction to the lying and uh, the addiction to the way the world sees you and treats you um, and all of the concern and care that goes into all of those things has been so well written. Um, this book is just incredibly well done as a story. I absolutely love it. Every time I read a new issue of this, I'm like, oh my God, like this book is so good. And issues one and two I was like, oh, I am intrigued. I want what's going on. Issue three was beautiful. It'll make you cry. Um, and just the origin story of so much of her relationship and her addiction. Um, what I love in issue three is that it does like 
parallel her story of her addiction with the with the story of her meeting her husband and all of their relationship um and what's going on in the modern time and then this just that fallout of all of that and her inability to learn and yet her complete knowledge while she's narrating of this is what they should have done to me this is how this should have been treated I should have made this decision and and knowing as she's saying it like I should not do this and then she yells and argues it out loud um with the other characters and then she does it and she makes these terrible decisions it's just so well done so if you haven't started crashing we're four issues in most of these IDW original titles have been five issues, so we may only get one more. Um, either way, don't wait on it. Just come grab issues, uh, at least issue one, and get started on it because it's so good. Um, and then lastly, from the team who brought us Ice Cream Man, we have issue one of Art Brute, also from Image. Um, you're, getting, you're getting ready. If you are an Ice Cream Man fan, you know that there's going to be some craziness when I open this up. If you haven't read Ice Cream Man, this one's going to be an actual ongoing story, not an anthology, it seems. But this is the story of um, the, a man who is an art detective, essentially. Um, and in our story, we start out with a bunch of people on a trip to the Louvre, and they are going to see the Mona Lisa. And when they they look at her, I have to show you, when they get up to see her, she is winking. And I love it because one of the characters is like, isn't, aren't, aren't both of her eyes supposed to be open? And it's like a confusing point, like, like they didn't know that the Mona Lisa wasn't winking. And they panic and they're like, oh, call the department of whatever it is. It's some ridiculous name of these people. And it then transfers us over to a woman who is the head of that art department, art investigation department, as she goes into um, a, an, a mental institution and she is meeting with a man who is a patient there. And he is, his name is Arthur, and he is our art group. And we find out that he is an art detective and the way he does, he has a, a tiny mannequin, a wooden mannequin named Manny, and Manny has a full name, and I need to look at the book to see it. Um, he is, uh, oh my gosh, what is it? Do to do. It's ridiculous. I don't want you. I maybe I should. Manford Morrington Wood, the third to be precise, is his name. And I'm just going to show you that page now that I brought it up. Um, but what we learn about our art brute is the way he works and the way he is able to see everything and help with all the art stuff is he can go inside of paintings. And he lives in, like, his preferred way to live is inside of the world of art. Um, and we get to see him do that and kind of take the detective around with him into the world behind the canvas. But at the same time, we get to see some other random little stories. Like, we see a, a young boy who um, is on the way to possibly a similar, like, mental institution or situation with his mother. Um, and he may... He, he may be connected to all of the crazy stuff that's happening. Um, this is going to be a really good story, honestly. Like, you already get the fun art that you get an Ice Cream Man. You get the weird eccentricities. You get the funny jokes. You get all of the, like, the world is a weird, strange place, and I'm, I'm just a part of it. Um, but you're also getting a really funny, uh, great written detective story at the same time that plays with it in a whole new way, which we know is this creative team's favorite thing to do is to play with the medium. And now that they're writing a book about art, I can only imagine how crazy they're going to get with all the things they've learned making Ice Cream Man as they develop in this story. So if you are a fan of Ice Cream Man and you wish that they would go in a single order and give you like a new story that's just actually a story, Art Brute's going to be your book. And honestly, if you've loved anything W. Maxwell Prince ever wrote, you just need to read it because it's fantastic. Um... I'm going to take another drink before. All right. We are going to talk about things we have in stock. Boop -a -doop, boop -boop -a -doo. Um, first up, we have signed copies of Stanley the Snowman issue one. Uh, Stanley the Snowman is a nonstop scoot title, which means it is for kids. Um, it also means, well, our family, 
Um, and it also means that nonstop is a scout thing where they issue, they release an issue one so you can test it out for usually $1.99. And then the rest of the title ends up being printed as a graphic novel immediately after. So um, Austin is telling me today that these first prints of Stanley the Snowman issue one are actually sold out. Um, we have quite a few and now they're all signed by Austin. So if you would like to come get your copy, um, we're apparently a place that you can find one. Um, also in stock this week, we have issue three of Kung Fu Legume from uh, Keen Spot. You know, who doesn't need a bean that attacks people with Kung Fu? Um, Radiant Black issue 20 is out this week. I cannot believe we're so far into Radiant Black. And this has been such a good story the whole time through. Um, the world's most wonderfully beautiful Jen Bartel Wonder Woman cover is out with issue 794 of Wonder Woman. I love this cover. I want to put it in like above my desk that I don't have. Um, issue three of Three Keys is out. Uh, this is an image book all about a, a girl who is fighting to save the world from destruction. Um, I'm very excited. This is another book that I didn't get to finish reading. It's the only reason it's not on this live stream probably. Uh, is book one of Tom King's new book, Danger Street, that's going to have another uh, world of our DC heroes we don't see a lot of, including Dr. Fate. So I'm very excited. Uh, Savage Avengers issue eight is out this week. Um, we've got Amazing Spider-Man 14. Are we on 14? I thought we were on 15. Nope. Nope, because this is the dark web issue. Okay. Just kidding. I don't know math. Um, Star Wars Bounty Hunters out this week, as well as The Mandalorian from Star Wars. There is two Star Wars titles out a week, so if you are a Star Wars fan, you are living your best life. Um, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Armageddon Game, The Alliance Issue 2. This Armageddon Game is our big event right now. This is one of the tie-ins. Um, Superman Son of Kal-El Issue 18. This is the Spawn variant for this week um, from Super so you got John Kins and, and uh, Spawn, you know, hanging out, doing their thing. Uh, that's not in the story at all. It's just on the cover. We're just doing Spawn variants. If you don't know, um, every DC title and every Image, com image Comics title for the next uh, month is going to have a Spawn variant in honor of the 30th anniversary of Image, of Spawn, and the, re um, the new issue of Batman Spawn that came out this week, which we're going to talk about in just a second. Uh, Legion of X, issue 8 out this week. Um, Dark Web X-Men tie-in issue one with, this is all about that, uh, Goblin Queen. What's going on with Maddie? We're gonna find out. Um, Batman Incorporated issue three out this week. We've got Batgirls issue 13. I love this cover. It's just so cute. Um, and so you gotta, you know, you need more, more of them two together on everything. Deadpool issue two for the new run of Deadpool out this week. We've got Dark Crisis, The Big Bang, issue one. This is our, or just one shot. It's not an issue one. This is the uh, lead into things that are coming next week. We're going to talk about that in a second for all of you DC fans. Uh, Planet Hulk World Breaker, issue two. This is the um, Planet Hulk story going on. This is not from the Ryan Otley story. This is a completely different one. And it is actually, I believe, Peter David. Is it Peter? No, Greg Pak writing it. Um, I knew it was somebody that's been doing a lot of the, the Marvel titles. Um, Harley Quinn Uncovered. This is a one-shot, and I love this homage cover um, that they got going on to uh, Crisis. It's just great. And then uh, Dawn Attack. This is issue one. This is the new Frank Frazetta title from Opus Comics. So for all you Frazetta fans, we got another title coming your way. Uh, Iron Man relaunched this week. This is Invincible Iron Man. It is a book featuring Tony Stark as well, but this, I love the Riri cover, so I had to bring you that one. Uh, Poison Ivy from G. Willow Wilson, issue six is out. We have Lovecraft Unknown, issue four out this week. For all of you Lovecraftian fans, uh, this is a great story uh, with a detective and a cat and uh, some Lovecraftian monsters. I love the way that cover feels. Um, Monica Rambo Photon, issue one is out. This is, I believe, going to probably be a five-part series. Uh, most of the Marvel minis have been recently, um, but I think I just looked it up. I think that it was, it was five-part, but I'm really excited. I'm glad to see Monica back uh, and getting some Monica lead stories is going to be great. Uh, Star Trek Resurgence issue two. This is one of uh, the new, the newest IDW Star Trek title. Uh, Blade Runner twenty thirty nine 
out with, I believe this is issue one, yes, uh, from Titan Comics. We've got Lord of the Jungle, issue two. Uh, I love this cover. This has, been, this has been a controversial cover this week because everybody has been trying to decide if they like when it looks like the damaged posters. Um, and then uh, one of our customers was telling me it looks like there's a sticker on it. And even though you know it's not, he was like, I can't. Like the sticker thing is driving me crazy because I keep looking at it. And I'm like, oh, there's a sticker on my comic. Um, so I, I love I love the conversation around the concept of those homage covers to the, the storybooks and posters. Um, Shirtless Bear Fighter Volume 2, Issue 5 is out this week. You know, what's that bear and that man up to? We'll find out. Um, Wildcast, Issue 2, also the Batman Spawn cover. So um, this is Matthew Rosenberg writing a Wildcat series, and everybody has been coming in talking about it since Issue 1. So um, if you liked Wildcats in the 90s, apparently Matthew Rosenberg is making you love it again. So... Um, Rick and Morty versus Cthulhu in the most like artistic cover I could have possibly designed for a Rick and Morty versus Cthulhu. It's like fine art cover. It's hilarious. Um, I, this, I know a lot of people have been excited for this one. So we have a ton of different covers. Um, Resident Alien, the book of love issue two of four. If you are a fan of the show, this is a new series to kind of jump in on. Um, give you some more story before the show gets caught up. Um, and then lastly, this week, issue uh, one shot of Batman Spawn. Uh, this is the thing that happened, a crossover that happened in the 90s. And we are doing it again. Todd McFarlane, Greg Capullo, all of your DC uh, and Spawn people that you could want. Jumping in on that. That's why you have your DC Spawn variants. It's why you have your image Spawn variants. Here it is. If you missed it, most of the crazy covers are sold out at this point, but we got a couple more cover A's if you want to jump in. Um, and then we got some trades. Woohoo! Very excited. Okay. Uh, they're all new, so I'm going to start somewhere else because. Oh, this one's not. Okay, so the non new trade this week is we have uh, volume one or. Uh, issue one through four, however you want to look at it, of Naughty List. And this is uh, the man behind the story of Santa Claus. This is uh, the Saint Nick himself. We see him in the modern times and he finds out that somebody stole his not his list and they are using it to um, do terrible things. And one of them is human trafficking and Santa Claus doesn't play that way. So he is going after this person and going to destroy them. Uh, from the Star Wars universe, we have volume one of the Star Wars Obi-Wan Kenobi current series that's ongoing. This is issues one through five. Uh, if you didn't get a chance to catch it, uh, this is your chance. Um, from Image Comics, this is the entirety of Bolero, which were all oversized square bound issues. So this is a massive trade and it's only $17.99, which is crazy for how big these issues are. I'm gonna, can I lean it down? Is that cool? Look at that. That is thick. This is only five issues of a story. And it is the story of a woman who um, feels like her life is like she can't get the, none of her relationship ever work out. And she feels like it's always somebody else's fault or it's like timing or something like that. So she ends up making a deal where she goes to this portal and she meets this cat who kind of controls time and offers her 52 chances to hop between different worlds but you can never go back to the one you've already come from and you can only do it 52 times and then you're kind of just stuck in the last one and she keeps getting to the point where she has a fight and like she gets her perfect relationship and then she has a fight or um something goes one of them has to move or somebody cheats on somebody or something and she uh decides that she doesn't like that world anymore because her relationship didn't work out. And so she just jumps to another one and she keeps doing that until eventually uh, she realizes she's not the only person who's doing that. She's not the only person who uh, has trouble in their relationships. And what she learns is that maybe uh, you just have to actually work through problems and not just try to run away from them. Great story of and super cool art. Um, from Marvel, Jane Foster and the Mighty Thor, the new miniseries that we just recently wrapped up for those five issues. This is out. Um, if you were a fan of Jane Foster's character in the, the movie and you want to see more of her actually being a badass, here's your chance. Uh, Bloodshot, book one. This is the new, uh, Bloodshot series that's running from Valiant, the first, uh, the first little little bit of it. I guess this is the one right before this. Where are we at? Can I, 
This is issues 2019. Yeah, this is the 2019. So this is the one right before the one we're on right now. A lot of people have been asking uh, what's going on with Bloodshot. Like, I missed it. This is the one right before if you need to jump in. Um, we've got volume one of Grimm. This is issues one through five. So if you're uh, wanting to get into Grimm, especially after we just talked about it and how you don't want to miss out on it, this is going to be your first five issues and kind of lead into it and get you ready for that issue six that just came out. So... Get in this. Don't miss it. Now's your chance to learn about that. Um, and then lastly, from AWA Upshot, we have their newest trade. All of their trades are $9.99. And this is for New Think. And this book made it into my picks of the week a lot. And honestly, I wish it would have just been in my picks of the week like every time because this is so well done. Um, this, is, this is Mark Russell level commentary on... Uh, how like society works and the things we're doing. I mean, this has a quote on it from some Congress people. Uh, like a Congresswoman spoke on the back. Uh, the creator of the Shield has a thing. The uh, like this has a lot of like really uh big name people. But this is it's supposed to be um a, the black a Black Mirror style anthology about how um we treat ourselves and our world and the way that people um either you know, the way we work with technology or the way we treat other humans or the way that we like politically are in align. Uh, this book is fantastic. It's 10 bucks. It's five issues. It's so good. It's anthology. So you can pick it up, read one, put it back down, grab the next one. Um, if you miss new think you need to, you need to grab it because it's so good. Um, all right. We got some books coming out this week. I know a lot of times people, you know, we talk about how there's not as many books coming out the week of, like, Christmas and things like that. Thankfully, this week, we're a little bit further ahead away, so we got some books. I'm only going to tell you about the indie books. There's not too, too much from Marvel and DC. I will tell you one DC book that's coming out is it the Dawn of the DCU, which is um, we've just had the Dark Crisis on Infinite Earths. We are launching into Lazarus Planet and what's happening. This is the dawn of that um, this week before we go into like the break before everything everything starts to rebuild uh, but our indie books out this week we have issue 11 of berserker issue 27 of something is killing the children issue 4 of vanish issue 13 of the scorched for the spawn fans um, we've got issue 9 of what's the furthest place from here issue 9 of rogue sun issue 3 of junkyard joe uh, issue four of Stuff of Nightmares, that R.L. Stein book that's been fantastic. Uh, issue two of I Hate Fairyland's newest volume. Issue three of Hitomi. Issue three of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Saturday Morning Adventure, uh, which is based off of the cartoons. Issue 103 of Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. Issue two of Chroma, which I'm very excited about. Uh, that book was one of my picks of the week when issue one came out. Um, issue eight of Death Dealer. Issue three of Volume Two of Eve. Issue four of Boogeyman. And finally, issue four of Breakout. This book has been delayed for so long. It's a Dark Horse title. It was it was one that issue one was the pick of the week, and issues two and three. I think we talked about how they should have been. Uh, issue four is finally here, like a year later. Um, Department of Truth has a one shot called Wild Fictions, which is coming out this week. Ghost Planet issue one. True Cult issue five. Deadliest Bouquet issue five. Voyages issue two. Uh, Traveling to Mars, speaking of Mark Russell, uh, issue two is out this week. Good Boy Volume 3, issue two is out. Uh, IDW's newest original, Dead Seas, launches with its issue one. A Legacy of Violence, issue three is out. Cover the Dead in Lime, issue three is finally out. I'm very excited. Um, Bone of the Gods, number one from Scout, as well as Road Trip to Hell, uh, number one from Scout is also out this week. Mysterium, issue two is out, and... Since we're talking about it, don't forget to check out Mysterium uh, and their escape rooms over on uh, over in Sarasota, across from the Hollywood Theater. They've got a bunch of escape rooms that are super fun. Uh, you can take your receipt from Bat City Monday through Thursday and save 20% off of your escape room experience. Or you can go to the escape room and then come to Bat City any day of the week and save 10% off your purchase. Um and while you're here, you can grab the comic. Um, issue three of Sulphur Wells is coming out. Also been a long time. A Blood Moon actually just, Blood Moon Comics just posted, I think it was like yesterday or the day before on um, 
on their LinkedIn that they had publishing delays and they are finally uh, caught up on all of them. So I'm excited to see these titles already out next week. Um, Curse of Cleaver County number one, Heaven's Rejects issue four, Arg the Argus issue three, and Highball issue four from Ahoy Comics. So there are still comics coming out this week. Don't miss them um, here at Bat City. We will be open on Wednesday. Stay tuned for more information about what the rest of our schedule will be like for Christmas. Most likely uh, we do know we will be closed Friday, so it's just kind of wait and see what Thursday is going to look like. We'll be closed Friday and Saturday and Sunday, though, for the holiday. Um, we won't have a live stream on Christmas, um, just in case you thought we would. Probably not going to do a live stream next Sunday. Um, please enjoy the time with your family and friends and whoever you're spending your holiday with. We hope it's a good one. Um, we hope it's it's a wonderful time. We hope you're safe more than anything. Uh, we will see you this Wednesday in the store for New Comic Book Day. If we don't, we will see you sometime next, not this next weekend, the weekend after, possibly sometime soon. We'll talk about comics on the internet and we'll wind down your weekend. Have a good night. Bye and happy holidays.